Okay, so um, uh, Richie Cotson, the album uh, Nomad is released on the 27th of September. I will, of course, put a purchasing link just below this video and urge you to check it out. Um, my, my first question before we talk about your wonderful new album is uh, uh, with uh, Mike Portnoy now in Dream Theatre and you releasing this solo album, uh, is this the end of the Winery Dogs? Oh, right to it, huh? Um, well, it's a question that it's quite important to me. So I love the winery dogs. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah, I love it too. Um, you know, uh, I wouldn't say, you know, it's the end because then that would, you know, I, I, I don't know that. I, I, I don't, um, I can tell you what I know. Uh, okay. When we played our last show in Japan mm -hmm. on, the, on the last tour, the vibe was really great. And uh, the attitude with all three of us was that if, you know, the stars align schedules permitting that we'd love to get together and play again. So that's where we left it. And, um, and the vibes were really good. So, you know, there, there's hope for the future, but like you said, I, I just, you know, made a new album and I'm focused on that. And Mike's, you know, doing what he's doing and, and Billy's on tour right now with Mr. Big. So, um, it's, you know, it's, it is, uh, is what it is. I hate that expression because it doesn't really mean anything, but it is what it is. If ever, if ever there was a case to, to use that expression. You guys parted on good terms. There's no reason why there won't be an album in the future, maybe. I mean, yeah, we, yeah, exactly. We parted on really good terms. It was, it was really a great, it was a great year for us to get out and play. We did 95 shows and, um, there was a lot of enthusiasm and, you know, I really liked the record we made. So it was all positive and it still is. And, you know, me doing what I'm doing, I've been doing this, making my own records since 1989, I've been putting them out. So, you know, I got a, a, a lot of them out there floating around. And so here's another one. Um, and uh, so nothing's really, you know, it's business as usual, I guess you'd say. Yeah. yeah. As Rocky Balboa says, it's over when it's over. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, John Lydon of the Sex Pistols said, anger is an energy. Uh, is Cheap Shots a testimony to the truth of that statement? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm kind of, I'm laying it out there in that in that song. Um, and uh, that song came together on uh, kind of out of nowhere. I was I was actually messing around on the guitar. Great and I guitar up, riff. Thank you. Well, I was just going to say, I, I just came up with that riff mm -hmm. out of the blue. And I liked it. And I thought, well, this would be fun to sing over. It was my thought. And so I, you know, I have things set up like the room I'm in now. I've got some audio gear here. And then downstairs directly under me is a drum room. So I ran down and I recorded what I thought would be an appropriate beat to go along with that riff. And then I, I kind of created a little bit of a loop around it and just sort of started singing, scatting over top of it somewhere along the line. I said the words cheap shots in my mumblings. And uh, when I listened back, there were a few key lines that I sang that I could decipher. Other things were gibberish. And I thought, well, let me write a story around this. And that's how really it came to be. And, and then, boom, there was the song. So it's not based on anyone in particular. It's just a, a general idea of betrayal, perhaps. So. Well, it's, yeah, it's based on that. It's based on what you just said on betrayal and, and the idea of, you know, a situation where maybe you're always there for someone helping, you know, doing this, doing that, listening to their, you know, their their misery and, and giving advice. And then suddenly they turn on you, yeah. you know, you know, out of out of nowhere. And, and so it's like, eh, OK, well, there you go. Um that's just who you are. Uh, but that's that's kind of the sentiment of it. You know, one thing I, I do, you know, write really what I would call conversational lyrics. You know, I, I always was that kind of a writer. You know, occasionally I'll have a play on words here and there, but not really abstract. You know, you can really read my my lyrics almost as if it were a story and kind of know where I'm coming from. And I think Cheap Shots kind of lays it out pretty good as yeah. far as, you know, what i'm talking about yeah yeah i uh, love the title of this album uh, nomad um does it in any way speak thematically with the rest of the songs on the album where did the title come from yeah titles for albums are, are always you know tricky for me because um you know i tend to be more composition oriented like you know 
each song unto itself. And that's what my focus goes into is the song as I'm writing and recording it. So then when I've got a collection of them, you know, to come up with a title, sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not so obvious. And with this one, you know, the first thing I did was uh, look at song titles. You know, I, 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 my probably my most the most important song to me on the album is Nihilist, but I thought that would be a little too extra as a title for the album. I don't want to send the the wrong message. Um, and then you know I had a couple title ideas that were not related to the to the song titles, but then when I was sequencing and looking at it, I thought, well, Nomad is fitting because, um, you know, the idea of being a musician and you're kind of always going here, going there. And I somehow um, have this fantasy of just simplifying things, you know, I mean, not, not having a lot of stuff and not having a lot of um, liability, you know, it's very appealing to me as mm -hmm. I get older, you know, yeah. and um, you know, I've collected a lot over the years and, and the idea of just getting rid of it, you know, mm -hmm. and having a very simplistic existence is something that that thought enters my mind way more at my age now than it ever did. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, maybe that's your title. Maybe Nomad is the actual uh, message, you know. Yeah. Maybe you could do a Brian Wilson and just uh, give up touring and go live in a studio. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny when I when I moved to L.A., um, one of the people I met was Dwayne Hitchings, who a piano player. And he wrote, Do You Think I'm Sexy with Rod Stewart. And okay. I, I was connected with him through my record company. And we wrote a few songs together. And when I met him, this is in, had to have been 92. He was living in the marina and he had a boat, right? Mm -hmm. And in the bottom, he had, it was so cool. I'll never forget it. Like all his keyboards were in the, I guess the hall is what you'd call it. And it surrounded him. So we sat in there and he had the recording device and, when we worked in there, it was really cool, you know. Right. It sounds um, excellent. So, huh? It sounds excellent. Absolutely. Yeah, excellent. yeah, yeah. Um, maybe, you I get an R maybe I get an RV and put a little studio in the back and then drive around. You could do that. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you mentioned it, actually. It was uh, a question I was not I was going to ask you what, it, what inspired the song Nihilist. I don't know. I really don't. I don't know what's inspired it, but it... It, it just kind of I, I know the attitude behind it when I when I when I did that, um, it, it, it was in my head that, you know, what do I know? What am I? What am I? That that yeah. thing was floating around in my head. And um, and that I think that's where the song came from. And so I probably recorded that bit first just so I wouldn't have forgotten it. But I know <clears throat> my attitude was that I'm just going to record whatever it is I hear. Yeah. And, and put it together and so that's why that if you get when you get to that midsection the solo section it's it's very freeform and it just kind of mm -hmm. floats around and, and i mean it definitely follows a path of some sort but it's not a it's not a familiar path yeah, yeah, and yeah. So it's one of those things that it just kind of came together but i know when i was writing it my attitude was like well wherever it goes it goes because mm -hmm. um, sometimes you know, as much as all this stuff is, um, you know, real and authentic and what have you, you're still you still find yourself in format. And yeah. what I mean by that, if you look at like the song Cheap Shots, it, it's a it's a fun rock tune, mm -hmm. but it's still that, you know, intro, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, solo, chorus. It's, you know, what most of people in this genre, it's how they write. Yeah, yeah. And so with a song like Nihilus, it's it doesn't totally abandon that but you know when you get to the middle of the song it definitely takes you on a little bit of a journey outside of the realm of what you would expect for a traditional rock song which i guess that it isn't really that i don't even know what it is but i just know that i don't know what inspired me but i do know the attitude i had when i was writing it was well it's going to write what i write and record what i record and you know yeah, i'll, I'll yeah. splice it together and make it work and and then that's what it was Sure. I mean, I hear a lot of a uh, lot of influences and stuff like that on this on this record. Um, the song "These Doors." I mean, how big are influences uh, R and B, soul, uh, and funk? Maybe a James Brown on you as a, a musician. Yeah. Well, my first concert that I remember going to was Stevie Wonder, 
And that was in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. They had this really cool venue where the stage was round and it, it turned. Okay. And shortly after that, I saw George Benson in the same venue. Right. And um, they, those concerts, you know, were very, you know, in, had an impact on me. And um, also the albums that I had, you know, I had Talking Book, which was an yeah. album that I played constantly. Yeah, and yeah. then the George Benson album I had was Breezin. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if that was 76 or 77, but, I, you know, I was a boy. And I remember having that record in my room playing it. You yeah. know? So, you know, that kind of influence, you know, it actually, it predates my rock influence. Okay. You know, that music predates the influence, the rock influence, because shortly thereafter, I saw a poster of Kiss. Okay. And then I was like, whoa, that's really cool. You know, I saw Gene. Uh -huh. blood breathing fire and i was like oh that's that's cool i want to do that <laughs> i want to do that and and then that led to iron maiden mm -hmm. so then and then maiden was the, the first actual hard rock concert i went to right, right. so i've got this kind of in, interesting you know juxtapose i guess you call it of influence where on one side you've got this r&b jazz influence mm -hmm. like the jazz from george the R and B soul from Stevie Wonder and a bit of jazz, obviously. And now, on the other hand, you've got this kind of you know Iron Maiden, Black Sabbath, Kiss influence. So I'm a mixed up kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know what James Brown said about Elvis Presley, don't you? I no, tell me. James Brown said Elvis Presley is just a hillbilly that discovered the blues, which I thought was absolutely excellent. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> um. Uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned Kiss there, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. But did you not work with Gene Simmons? I did. And uh, so, what was Gene Simmons like? Was he a challenging soul? And um, how big a Kiss fan were you in the day? I think you've kind of touched upon that already. Oh well, yeah, I was a massive Kiss fan, and I owned uh, a studio in North Hollywood. I mm -hmm. I had come off. Um, a, a, playing with the band Mr. Big okay. and we had done, done some work and um, I ended up buying a commercial building in North Hollywood and I converted it into a recording studio and Gene Simmons became a client mm -hmm. and he, he knew of me before actually. Um, I had met him many years ago when we shared the same manager. Uh, but anyway, he came in the studio and he recorded his solo album there. And so I was, well, was that day. was that the asshole. asshole, right? Yeah. And we became what I considered friends because we had a lot of conversations and, um, you know, some personal conversations as well. Um, but I'll tell you a funny story. I think it's OK to tell this story. Mm -hmm. um, but he had told me that he said, I want to have a meeting with you. I have a business proposition. And so I went to his home and um, he said, I think it would be a great idea to franchise your recording studio. And I'm like, really? What do you mean? So he explained to me what he meant. Mm -hmm. And so it would be a partnership and we would, you know, use his name in, in the name of the studio. And, and my, mm -hmm. I guess he must have liked the way I built the studio, the aesthetic of it. And, and, and the fact that, well, he liked the way it looked and the way it was, whatever. And so he wanted to do some sort of deal. And so I, I, I was thinking about this and it didn't really make a lot of sense to me because I thought to myself, well, this man could come in and just buy the studio yeah. easily, you know, cash and, and do whatever he wants. He doesn't need me. So a week went by and I couldn't really process this very well because it just didn't add up. And then he said, well, come back. We'll have another conversation. So I went back to his house mm -hmm. and I finally I said, well, I said, why don't you just buy the building and and do whatever you want with it. Like, what do you need me for? And he goes, oh, no. He said, I don't invest with my own money. You right. know, he just, and, and so I, that's very smart, you know, so you're going to lend the name. And, and, I, and at that point, I said, well, this, what you want to do would be at least, you know, 10 or $15 million to go around the country and buy buildings and, and build them out. And I said, I don't really have that kind of capital for a deal like that. And then, Literally two months later, I sold the building to Travis Barker and uh, and that was the end of it. But that was my um, that was my, uh, you know, interaction with with Gene, like the business guy. 
And it was it was pretty clever. You know, it, it made a lot of sense after he said it, mm -hmm. but it just wasn't something that I was capable of doing. But, you know, personally, um, you know, I, I really enjoyed my time, you know, hanging out with him. We were making the record and I saw him recently. Uh, the winery dogs opened for Kiss in Spain. Right. So I got to 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 say hello to him, and then I, I ran into him um, at the Sunset Marquee recently and said hello. So uh, it's kind of cool to to have that kind of interaction with someone that was that big of an influence early on, you know, in, in the in my musical journey. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. Um, uh, back to the album. How did you get that amazing bass sound on uh, Insomnia? Ah, thank you, thank you for noticing. Um, well, the bass on that song is quite elaborate. And I will tell you, there's four basses on that song. So what what you've got is the basic, typical, you know, bass guitar, right? That mm -hmm. track. And then cer certain lines on the fretted bass, I, um, I double an octave higher. So key yeah. lines that I want to stand out and something I've done, you know, over the years. Um, and so that's that. So those two basses live together to orchestrate it. And then there's two keyboard basses. Um, one is a very round, low kind of yeah. keyboard bass. And then another one is a more kind of has teeth on it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And those two basses play different lines at different times. Okay. Uh, every chorus um, you'll hear like a like this kind of I, I literally go up to the keyboard and strike it and and that's like a, an accent mm -hmm. um, the first person I saw do it was Stanley Clark we were recording some something and we were doing some stuff and he did it and I'm like yeah that's that sound that I've heard on all those R&B records that's how you do it okay nice. so I kind of you know learned that from from Stanley and um but uh yeah, so that's it, it was, you know, it's orchestrated, you know, a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, there's another trick leading into the last chorus. Um, I do this trick that uh, I've done for a very long time where you take the tuning peg and you, you turn it, you, you detune the bass very quickly. And mm -hmm. essentially what you're doing is a dive bomb. Right. You know? you know, I remember the first time I did that was many, many moons ago. Um, and I wanted to replicate, you know, I had a, a tremolo arm you know do the dive bomb i wanted to do it on the bass mm -hmm. so most obvious thing would be to to turn the tuning peg yeah, yeah, and yeah. So, you know you, you can hear that um and then there's a lick that's played there there bam and that's obviously doubled as i described earlier yeah yeah it's interesting the on, on the beatles day in the life there's a uh, like several pianos uh, at the end of that song yeah, the idea was that they were never going to perform this music live. They were just going back to the studio band. My question to you then is, uh, are you going to take four bass players out on tour with you? No. And, you know, that's <laughs> the thing. What you said is really, you know, it's interesting you said about that song, about the attitude behind it, because that's my attitude whenever I record something. Um, I never, ever, ever, ever think about live. You know, because some people might be, oh, well, you know, well, don't do that. How are you going to do it live? So it, my attitude is I may never do it live. Yeah, it yeah. may never happen. I may never get to the point where I have an opportunity to do it live. So why mm -hmm. even think in those terms? Why not think in the terms of we're in the studio now. Let's make this song the best representation of this song that it could possibly be. And if that requires a violin solo or a trumpet passage, put it on. Yeah, yeah. You know, when live rolls around, you know, maybe you do a different arrangement. Maybe you do it acoustically with just guitar and voice, or maybe you do it as a power trio, or maybe by then you're, you're touring with an orchestra. Who knows? Yeah. You know, so yeah. I don't like the idea of putting, of closing doors. I don't like the idea of closing creative doors when I'm, you know, recording a song. Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting, actually. I mean, we touched upon the Beatles. McCartney said uh, yesterday and uh, let it be came to him in a, in dreams or inspired by dreams. Now, I've heard you say the same thing about a couple of songs on your album. Yeah. I suppose my question is, uh, do you think these are just random jumble thoughts or, I don't know, some higher power, perhaps? 
No, I don't think it's necessarily a higher power, but I've definitely been woken up by song ideas and thought to myself, you know, go back to bed, you'll do it, you know, deal with it tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes and I don't remember. So what I've learned to do over the years when that happens, if it's something that really is jarring, that wakes me up, I'll force myself to get out of bed. Or sometimes it happens in a dream state, and then I, I know that I'm kind of in this dream state, and I and I get up and deal with it because I think rather than the idea of a higher power, I think what happens is your mind relaxes and and opens up, and just yeah. by the nature of how we're wired, we have thoughts, yeah, and yeah. those thoughts are are you know can be um, inhibited during the day you know when an email comes in or you your stock portfolio <laughs> looks yeah. weak that day or whatever distraction you have in life um so um i think that's really what that is now as mm. as a creative person you know if you have the discipline to to get your ass out of bed and document your idea then you can come up with some really cool stuff and some really honest, authentic stuff because you're getting, you're receiving in that really pure, undistracted state of mind. Right, right. Um, I was in just, uh, well, actually, my hometown is uh, Reading, which is Reading in England. You're from Oh, Reading. what a coincidence. Yeah, me, my mine is Reading in Pennsylvania. There you go, Reading, Pennsylvania. So my question is, if you're from Reading, Pennsylvania, that must make you a huge Hall of Notes fan, doesn't it? And Taylor Swift, because she's from there, too. OK. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, Hall & Oates, you know, actually, uh, it was told to me that Daryl's parents bought carpet at my dad's carpet store years ago. Yeah. Um, and I, I met Daryl once and I totally embarrassed myself trying to, you know, make the connection. And he was very polite about it. But I mean, he was a huge star, you know, out of there by the time I um I, you know, met him. I mean, by the time I was around, you know, mm -hmm. I was a kid, rich girl. I remember singing rich girl because it had the word bitch in it. Mm -hmm. And I was in in uh, kindergarten or first grade. Yeah. And my friend had to sing the lyrics because we got to say a bad word, you know, <laughs> it's a bitch girl or whatever. Um, uh, but yeah, Hall and Oates was a big influence. Um, and, um, and I knew that he was from the area, you know, you know, uh, yeah, big influence on, on me as a singer and, and even a writer, too. Yeah, excellent. Um, what was it like opening for the Stones? Um, do you have any Keith stories? Um, I don't have any Keith Richards stories. I have, I just remember that um, we did a group photo at the end, and uh, Ron Wood had heard me play, and he came up to me in front of everybody, in front of Mick Jagger, and he was talking to Mick, and he looked at Mick and said, did you hear him sing, meaning me? Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, Mick said, no, I didn't. And, and then he put his hand on my throat, and he said, oh, my God, he said, your voice, he, he said, sounds like a cross between Rod Stewart and Bernard Fowler, mm -hmm. which is a massive compliment. Now, Bernard Fowler I've known for, you know, 25 years, and... Um, and so uh, he's the singer that has been with that band forever, the background singer. And and he and I are, are friends, and and he also is one of my favorite singers. So, And I actually did listen a lot to Rod Stewart, and, and Rod was a, a big influence on my singing style. And so for me, that was like the ultimate compliment, you know. Yeah. And then to have you know Ron Wood say it in front of his bandmates was pretty crazy, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that was the big moment for me. Uh, the actual performance, I remember the sound, you know, um, the sound checks were so quick because everything just sounded right. And mm -hmm. I two things that I hate are sound check and rehearsal. Yeah. Um, and I, I like when it comes time for sound checks, I just want to get it, you know, get it over with. If it sounds good, don't touch it. Great. We're good. And I just remember one of the things about that tour, and I think I, I did six shows or five shows. And every sound check was just nailed. I had to say very little. And, you know, it was an amazing experience. I, I was, you know, quite young. And uh, it was told to me that I was the only act to ever open for the Rolling Stones in Japan. 
mm-hmm. because uh-huh. Japan typically they don't have an opening act. Sure. You know, usually uh, the headliner, people go to see the headliner and that's the end of it. Yeah. So it was really, and you know, I also, one of the things I do remember is that I didn't tell anybody I was doing it until after it happened because I just felt like it was such a big deal that, you know how you say stuff and it goes out and then, you know, oh, if it doesn't happen then you know, there's that disappointment and yeah. embarrassment. So I didn't say anything. Um, and then after I did, you know, after I did it, I said, oh, guess what I did, <laughs> you know, and I have a picture, um, I have a picture of us together. I took my dad there with me. He's in the photograph and, um, I have a picture and I have the pass and the set list and a f- few things it's framed in the hallway. So, you know, oh, excellent. Excellent. Um, Right, I've gone through all my questions, really. I do have a, a question for you that's a, a bit of a tricky one. Uh, yeah. As a guitar player, Hendrix or Jeff Beck, which was better, do you think? Oh, well, you know, it's not who's better. It's just who would you prefer to listen to. Okay. You know, um, I guess, you know, if you if you said you have to pick one or the other, I guess I'd have to pick Jeff Beck. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know... Um, it's a little bit of a tricky thing because obviously I never saw Jimmy play live, yeah. but I did see Jeff Beck play live. Right. And I do. And so I'm sure that's part of my, um, why I went that way. But um, I will say it was the greatest s- guitar sound I've ever heard live in my life. Yeah. yeah. I remember I was in here in, in LA and it was universal. They had a venue there that they don't have anymore. But I, I, I remember sitting there just in awe, like, man, this guy's sound is just so beautiful and the control and just the tones and, it, you know, it's really an amazing experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, my last question is a question I ask everybody, really, and that's uh, 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 Frank Zappa famously said, uh, jazz isn't dead, it just smells funny. Uh, yeah. With um, rock and roll now, a lot of bands now miming and playing to backing tracks. How healthy, in your opinion, is rock and roll? Oh, well, I don't really know. I I don't really follow things that way or or concern myself too much with the status of rock. I mean, I always hear the conversations, and this is something I never engage in. I'm not really sure why, um, but you know. It's interesting how when cover bands go and play and they pick songs to play, they're always going back to those like early Aerosmith songs, early ACDC songs, early Led Zeppelin songs, Yeah, you know, or, you know, it's like, you know, it's hard to beat that yeah. no matter what, no matter who you are. I mean, so you know, for, especially for bands. I mean, there's been great bands and that have made amazing records, you know. I mean, the other day, uh, you know, my wife is finishing up a song and we're listening to the mix. And I said, hey, listen to this Oasis song. Sure. Just for perspective on the lead vocal. And, like, I just remembered that album being one of the greatest albums, you know, rock albums for me, you know. Yeah. And so... But the point is that you keep going back. So every now and then you have a rock album that comes out that's so badass, like the first Guns N' Roses album or that Oasis album, or maybe, mm-hmm. you know, everybody has their favorite. But there's something to be said for the fact that people keep going back to those other bands that I mentioned. Um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, things evolve. One of the things that I will say that's very interesting to me Sure. Is technology has created a, a situation where people are making music that would never, ever, ever be able to make music. And the music mm-hmm. is being made now by non-musicians. Mm-hmm. And I when I say non-musicians, it's not meant to be an insult. It's like the criteria of what would define a musician from when you and I came up learning and playing is very different. Yeah. If that was a constant, you'd have a lot less going on and sure. you know being so technology has made a thing where people that are not necessarily musicians by our definition are able to make music now that's not necessarily a bad thing mm-hmm. it means there's more and there's more variety 
and and there's more perspective. So, you know, to find what 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 I might like out there in music, yeah. there might be less of it because the skill set is very different, mm -hmm. you know. There, and, and and another thing I have to say too that's very strange with the musicians like so, you know, um Eddie Van Halen. Mhm. Mm great guitar player, greatest guitar player, however you want to define him, but also in the context of making great music that people that aren't guitar players want to listen to. Yeah, yeah. That's the biggest component. Unfortunately, that's the component that's missing with the new generation of great, quote unquote, great musicians. See, and by the way, great musicians in my mind should make great music. Sure. They, it's the great musician plays impossible stuff yeah. really well. So that that now makes them great at doing that. But what to me is missing is that you don't have that other component. Steve Lukather, amazing guitar player, mm -hmm. but also making great music that stands mm -hmm. the test of time that people still want to listen to. Yeah, yeah. And so it feels like somehow the 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 abilities in the guitar world have kind of you know they're, they're growing going up 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 and, and deeper knowledge of scales and harmony and facility and execution but complete abandonment on making music sure. so it's quite strange it's very bizarre yeah um and uh you know i don't know what to make it doesn't really i don't really care it doesn't affect me because all the great records that i like listening to have been made yeah. and occasionally i hear something you know something new that i'm like oh wow that's really that's a really cool song yeah. or whatever but it's just an interesting observation to look at you know how the the musicians have ab abandoned the idea of creativity in making music Trouble. and just solely focused on the ability to move on the instrument does that make sense what I'm saying? It does, yeah. 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 Um, a little disappointing. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, I'll just plug the album again. Uh, so the album is uh, uh, Richie uh, Kotzen Nomad. It's out on the 27th of September. As I said, there's a purchasing link just below this video. Uh, Richie, thank you so much for your time. And it's probably quite early where you are now. So I'll, you have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, all the best. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.